Oh, hi, hey, hello, everyone. <laughs> How are you all doing tonight? I'm supposed to say that we promised to bring you the very best one-star reviews from all across the multiverse. But you know what? I don't believe it. I don't believe that for one second. I'm rating my driver Marcus one star. Not for his driving ability, but instead for his disloyalty and cowardice. I love the moon. Yeah! Moon! 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 And as an independent podcast team with the entirety of our egos and self-worth wrapped up in the perceived success of our shows, we know firsthand that receiving a one-star review can, at times, be the most traumatising experience in a person's life. I don't even like them all. I prefer La La Rue leggings and my essential oils. But these kids wouldn't shut up about, let's go to the mall, Karen, take us to the mall. So what am I supposed to do? These aren't my kids. Their well-being is not my problem. Welcome back once again to the space window for what is sure to be the worst podcast in the world, The One Stars. This has nothing to do with the movie Space Jam. I love Michael Jordan, and I've always been a fan of Bugs Bunny, basketball, and aliens. I set the gun down on the merry-go-round, turned my back for like 30 minutes tops, came back from the slide, and it was gone. Just gone. (laughs) No clue what happened there. But that's actually what led me to your product. The One Stars is a Good Point Podcast. From what we gather as something emerged from the dwarf, start higher easier, and presumably tore apart the golem. The energy signature of Tiresias changed significantly at 6.43 set time. At that point all telemetry cut out. We do know that something left a large amount of organic matter in its wake. A trail of an ashy substance can be found leading from Tiresias past the Gorlin and onward out of the solar system. All data was corrupted beyond recovery and this symbol was found repeatedly all over the station. I know it. I remember. It was there in Eden. I'm sure of it. The reluctant, immortal Adam Delta V must defend the very structure of the universe whilst confronting his past. Do you remember? No, you do not. You are close inside. Where are you now? Where is your true form? Sailing through the void. Searching. For what? Inside. Adam Delta 5. Inside. Chain of Being, a mythic sci fi podcast. Listen now where all good podcasts are found. My name is Marty Hatchet. Friends call me Dennis Lunchtime. You can call me whatever you please. Just don't call me a liar, because I'm trying to save your skin here, youngin'. How do I know all this about this tree, you want to ask? I know more about this and any other tree than any person could ever care to. I know firsthand what a threat trees pose to the world. An oak can drop as many as 10,000 acorns a year. You know what was here before people? Trees. You know what'll be around long after we're gone unless somebody does something about it? That's right, now you're getting it. Tree Slayer. Available only on Channel 34 Sketch Comedy Radio. Available anywhere you get your podcasts. The New Colossus is a completely unhinged dark comedy reboot of Anton Chekhov's classic play, The Seagull. Content warning. The New Colossus audio drama is rated R for content. Episodes contain explicit language, lust and sexual situations, gunfire, death, dysfunctional conversations, illness, bad theater, anti-patriotism, drinking, and arm wrestling. You'll laugh. You'll cry. We hope you enjoy The New Colossus. (laughs) 
Hi, this is Bob Ramunda, one of the members of the team bringing you the PodTales programming you just listened to. PodTales is committed to free, accessible programming to explore and celebrate the art of creative audio fiction. That means our live panels are captioned and ASL interpreted, the episodes in our podcast feed have accessible transcripts, and all our programming is free. But in order to make that happen, we need support from fans, creators, and listeners just like you. If you can, the best way to help PodTales grow is through a monthly contribution over on our Patreon page. Any amount that you can offer gets you year-round access to our Discord server, early access to episodes, updates from PodTales HQ, and more. Check out the goals on the page for some cool plans we have coming soon. Head on over to patreon.com slash podtails to make your contribution today. Help us keep podtails free and accessible and help us celebrate the incredible world of audio fiction. Again, that's patreon.com slash podtails. Thanks. Have you ever listened to the world? I mean, really listened. Just stopped and stood still and listened intentionally. What do you hear? Birds? Traffic? Your loud upstairs neighbor having a solo dance party? Some people can hear the buzzing of electricity, even over other sounds. That's pretty cool. As for me, I never really thought about it much. I could hear, so I could hear. Nothing special about that. I guess if I had to choose, a sound I've always liked is the sound of a dinner party. People chatting, silverware thinking. You never know when things will change. Or how they'll change. Or how that will change you. Seen and Not Heard, an audio drama about hearing loss and deaf gain, is available wherever you find your podcasts. And this thing is going to actually shoot out three ciphers at you. 37. That's 88. I think he's rolling on the real table. That's 25. He said he was going to use the book for one thing and one thing only, this chase. This is what happens. The field of view just narrows intensely, and all of you can see 10 times further than normal. Well, because you're adjusting to this, you can only see 10 times further than normal. It's like looking through binoculars. Ah. Oh, the headaches. Yeah. The second thing is that the tarp catches on fire. And the third thing is you can all hear each other's thoughts oh, as no! you all unanimously what? scream. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> That's my daughter, Hopper Scotch! This <laughs> 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 is just because permanently thinking that at any point in time. Is it the first thing Ellie thinks of when hearing fire and, and seeing ten times more than normal? The first thought is, that's my daughter Hopper Scotch. I was gonna say, Hopper, like, his first order of business is that he and Ellie are both still right next to the now flaming tarp, so he's gonna try to handle that. But then he would hear, that's my daughter Hopper Scotch, and he would think that Sarah was there, so he would be, like, looking around, like, is she here? I can see ten times far than normal. So, <laughs> it's just a lot of things happened at once. Quest Friends, a podcast about friendship, family, and a statistically unlikely number of surprise daughters. Transcripts and recommended first episodes can be found at questfriendspodcast.com/about. A time of civil unrest, non-hair-related salons, and the most innovative stage magic ever seen in a union house. You know, I don't know if you can tell, but the excitement is palpable out there. Historically, no one's seen anything like this. In 1699, I mean. That is, 
Until it was your state. God damn it, I don't want to die! I have a reservation tonight! Which brings us to now. Berlin, 1933. A time of more civil unrest, artistic pretensions, and rising evil. Where a self-involved set designer... You see these? These are Lamarck's own original notes on the vanishing box. My most prized possessions in the world. An American con man. I'll even lend you the cape. You have a cape? I have a sheet. And a mysterious scientist. Where was it you said you went again? You can't speak its name. Ignore their history in pursuit of the mystery behind the vanishing box. The vanishing box. Vanishing box. The 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 Vanishing Act, a rambling absurdity in 12 parts, coming this summer. The show's about Lamarck's vanishing box. I remade Lamarck's vanishing box. Nothing could go wrong. All right? All right, punch it. Twins, 12 years old. Kids, the mission isn't a game. You're right. And it's a mission that you can't meet alone. You need help. Besides, these aren't just any children. They are family. Oh, same excuse every time you have chores. Oh, well, you'd probably like this one, Alexa. The main character's Puerto Rican like us. Take back time. American soldier Lieutenant Horacio Mendez is fighting a war on a foreign shore when he's pulled through an interdimensional portal into a time storm. Ah, how cool is that? I don't do interdimensional portals. Whoa, that storm sure is close. Bueno, I'm just glad you're not scheduled to fly a plane in this. Can we turn on the air? You know the rules. No air conditioning after <sighs> Labor, Labor Day. Day. When I was growing up in Puerto Rico, we just cranked, cranked open, open the, the window. window. We're in agreement then. Yes, I'm summoning Alexa and Benito Ventura into the time storm. Hi. Hi. Oh, I can't believe you're here. Oh, twins. Benito and Alexa Ventura, tremendous. You can travel in time, and whenever, wherever you arrive on Earth, you'll exist alive as can be. You can help me. No, we can't. Horacio said we both have a choice. You can choose to stay, and I can choose to go without you. Oh, right. You fly around in some other century. I'll hang here, wondering if you're ever going to return. Benny. You're finally ready? The mission isn't about being saviors of a culture. It's about preserving and raising up what's already there. You'll need to redefine what it means to save history. Witness. Witness. Find. Remember. Podtales is committed to free, accessible programming to explore and celebrate the art of creative fiction podcasting. That means our live panels are captioned and ASL interpreted. The episodes in our podcast feed have accessible transcripts, and all our programming is free. Free! Free. But in order to make all of that happen, we need support from fans, from creators, from listeners like you. If you can, the best way to help Podtails grow is through a monthly contribution over on our Patreon page. Any amount that you can offer gets you year-round access to our Discord server, early access to episodes, and more. We have some really exciting things planned. Head on over to patreon.com slash podtails to make your contribution today. Help us keep podtails free and accessible, and help us celebrate the incredible world of fiction podcasting. Again, that's patreon.com slash podtails. Thanks. The universe has an eternal heartbeat. It's not wrong, you know, to need somebody. Maybe you needed me too, maybe you just, you just did not ask. Each pulse quiet and across remote dimensions. If I had my sword, I would run you through. 
you would find that the most difficult task of your life. And you're lost. Though seldom heard, when a beat sounds, there can arise. Now, a simple, deep breath. <sighs> Center your mind. I can't. Yes, you can. A strange love. years protecting this forest from humans from your kind i kept this island human free come to me oh what fun my kingdom spreads within his i am a secret king <laughs> my silken Their jaws and teeth became material, so they could tear at their prey. Round and round, never leave. Father, I, I know you don't want me here. I walked west of the sun for your touch. Do you believe in grace? I walked east of the moon for your kiss. <laughs> I loved, and for a time, I was real. Strange Love, an audio fiction anthology series. Fantasy, sci-fi, macabre. Written and produced by William J. Meyer. Listen on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and strangelovepodcast.com. think we're weird. So everything's okay? Mami, calmate. I'll be fine. We both know she's fretting about you, but I've been telling her our baby girl is going to thrive. Aw, mom. <laughs> I promise you guys, I have my telepathy completely under control. Dane's Inferno seems really dark. It's basically a tabloid with poetry. Weird twist, but I'm listening. Well, I have to pay for school somehow. You know, my offer still stands. Not this again. Here's the thing. I kind of do want to tell you, but... Hey, no pressure. You don't have to tell me... My parents passed away two years ago. I can't let myself slip like that. Again. It's none of my business. I remember what freshman year can be like. You're still in college! I'm in my senior year. It's different. <laughs> God, I wish I had better control. Tell me about it. I'm worried about you! Quit it! I said I'm fine. I would do everything you do if I could, but I can't. How do I make this right? So, yeah. My first semester of college is going... great. I got this. The Path Down. A sci-fi audio drama about grief, privilege, and superpowers. Okay, I think this is working. Um, uh, hi. You're listening to Soundstage, theater for your ears, and new anthology coming to you from Playwrights Horizons. We're a nonprofit off Broadway theater in Hell's Kitchen, New York City, and we're committed to the advancement of contemporary American playwrights. My name is Adam Greenfield. I'm the theater's associate artistic director. And, um, okay, so I thought I was going to be recording this introduction in a studio somewhere, gearing up for like a splashy summer release of this series, but instead I'm sitting in my clothes closet in my apartment in Brooklyn, working from home uh, in this new socially distant reality, recording this into my laptop with a mic that I didn't even know I had, which I found in my basement. 
But if you're like me, you really miss being at the theater right now, which is why we at Players Horizons didn't want to wait a second longer to release this series, but are instead rush ordering this over to you with my recorded in a closet introduction. Um, Soundstage is a new program of our theater, and it will continue long after this COVID-19 crisis, but we felt like the moment to launch this series has to be right now, because until we're able to gather safely in a theater again, we're determined to continue our work to bring artists and audiences together. So um, we started making these recordings a little more than a year ago, As committed podcast listeners ourselves, we were thinking about the new explosion of audio as a medium, and we started to get curious about what the inventive, adaptable, rule-breaking, genre-busting mind of the contemporary American playwright might bring to scripted audio storytelling. We started by commissioning a handful of writers, specifically trying to build the rangiest anthology we could imagine— written not to be recorded live in front of an audience, but instead to be something that's native to the digital medium, written specifically for audio. Each piece is uh, vastly, dimensionally different from its comrades in the collection. We use theater directors, theater actors, and theater designers, and we're really delighted by the way it's turned out. The first four pieces you'll hear are a lush musical mass composed by Heather Christian, an anthemic spy thriller written by Robert O'Hara, a mind-bending participatory new theater piece written by Jordan Harrison, and a collection of cutting room floor interviews with his parents written by Kui Gwen. And we have additional pieces that are in the works by Lucas Nath, Milo Kramer, Kirsten Childs, Jenny Schwartz, Carlos Murillo, Kate Tarker, and Jeremy O'Harris. It's been an awesome ride making this series. I mean, we're a theater company. We make plays that happen in rooms with people. Uh, We didn't really know how to make stuff like this. So yeah, there was a big learning curve in making these. It was a process that was full of surprises as we learned how to do it. But it has been truly a blast, and we're excited to share them with you. We hope you enjoy listening to these as much as we enjoyed making them. I've seen you prodding the rim of a behemoth skull inside a dream you don't remember, excavating calcite layers of secret and lie. But despite your caution, the object of your searching gazes upon your delicate frame and ingests you from cell to organ to the theory of your imagination, and I do nothing to help you. I just hit record and applaud the thousand mouths that swallow. The nesting zone is surrounded by a 500-foot-tall hedge jungle, a rim of tropic glacial paradise gnawed ceaselessly by paleomythic reptiles. The stars in the sky were evil, a sin, the souls of long-lost devils dancing naked in the dark. (laughs) You think the chameleons have a sense of humor? I think the chameleons have a sense of everything. Every few days, a battle fight breaks out. Automatic weapon fire popping against the extra-dimensional moons of megafauna. Peekaboo, I'll eat you. Staying sane isn't an option here. No one is ever going to hear your story. The ones you're trying to tell? Ectothermic angels on all fours, vomiting out the blood of heaven to bless the battlefield. (laughs) They're all going to be eaten. If you're listening to this story in hopes of finding meaning, go ahead and slice your ears off. Come on, tell me, how close can you stare? at the tip of a knife. The Great Chameleon War, a surreal audio drama 
visit thegreatchameleonwar.com for more. Hi, this is Jeff Andreessen, one of the members of the team bringing you the Podtails programming you just listened to. Podtails is committed to free, accessible programming to explore and celebrate the art of creative audio fiction. That means our live panels are captioned and ASL interpreted, the episodes in our podcast feed have accessible transcripts, and all our programming is free. But in order to make all that happen, we need support from fans, creators, and listeners like you. If you can, the best way to help Podtails grow is through a monthly contribution over on our Patreon page. Any amount that you can offer gets you year-round access to our Discord server, early access to episodes, updates from Podtails HQ, and more. Check out the goals on the page for some really cool plans we have coming up. Head on over to patreon.com slash podtails to make your contribution today. Help us keep Podtails free and accessible, and help us celebrate the incredible world of audio fiction. Again, that's patreon.com slash podtails. Thanks. What? Has this ever happened to you? You're pouring a bowl of your morning cereal, only to find that in the night your apartment's been overrun by pigeons? Then listen to The Gods Had Incidental, a dramedy about advice columnists, an absurd city full of gods, and pigeons. A lot of pigeons. The God Said Incidental is currently streaming on your podcatcher of choice, including Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Radio Public, and more. If you'd like more information about The God Said Incidental, you can find our website at godsaidincidental.com. I notice that your first destination is Arabella, but that's not on your way. It's the first destination the writer went to. It's sacred. <laughs> Oh, how excited are you? On a scale of 1 to 10. A billion! I thought the waters at Coast Venus were clear. This is... That's something else. Visitors. Of course. You're Captain Valeria, right? Of the Ultramarine? Yep. That's me, and that's her, the Ultramarine. Sentimentality is a virtue of ours. It is ingrained in our people. I'm sure such a thoughtful gift will cheer her right up. One of the most important people we have to meet is in Arabella. Who was this person? Uh, no one knows, actually. Signed Venus, Part 1. Listen on May 27. Do you two know anything? Tomorrow I'll do something out of stories. My feet will walk on earth that is not of earth. Unforeseen circumstances are hard to prepare for. If you can prepare for them, they're foreseen. Unless our plans change catastrophically, it should be fine. I have been asleep for decades. How much more patience do you want? They're growing us a village next to the base of a space elevator on a brand new planet. For you to have this new and better world, I have to stay behind and make it. Unimaginable animals. Mm -hmm. You didn't try the cheese. What will it mean for all the stories you've told me to be alive on a new world? so beautiful. Trust me. Here we go. Check out This Planet Needs a Name everywhere podcasts are found. Podtails is committed to free, accessible programming to explore and celebrate the art of creative audio fiction. That means our live panels are captioned and ASL interpreted. 
The episodes in our podcast feed have accessible transcripts, and all our programming is free. Free! Free. But in order to make all of that happen, we need support from fans, from creators, from listeners like you. If you can, the best way to help Podtails grow is through a monthly contribution over on our Patreon page. Any amount that you can offer gets you year-round access to our Discord server, early access to episodes, and more. We have some really exciting things planned. Head on over to patreon.com slash podtails to make your contribution today. Help us keep Podtails free and accessible, and help us celebrate the incredible world of audio fiction. Again, that's patreon.com slash podtails. Thanks! Hello, everyone, and welcome to Podtails 2020. I'm Jordan Stillman, one of the organizers of Podtails. We are so excited to be putting on programming devoted exclusively to imaginative audio storytelling throughout the month of November. Today, we will be treating you to the panel Writing in a Room. Thank you so much for joining us. At the top of this program, we would like to offer a land acknowledgement, a statement that pays respect to the indigenous people who live here and who had their land stolen from them by colonizers. It is only the very first barest step in what we can do to support indigenous people today. The following acknowledgement of what to keep in mind as we participate in this digital space is written by Adrian Wong of Spiderweb. Since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technology, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art we make leave significant carbon footprints contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect Indigenous people worldwide. I invite you to join us in acknowledging all this, as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. I'm now going to pass it over to Lee to make an acknowledgement of country. Thank you. And before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that I appear in this panel from the stolen lands of the Bun Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. The sovereignty of this land was never ceded. Australia is, was, and always will be Aboriginal land. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging, and also acknowledge any First Nations people around the globe watching or listening to this panel, extending that same respect to you and your elders past, present, and emerging. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Next, I would like to thank our sponsors, Sarah Lawrence College and the Sarahs, Fool and Scholar Productions, Fable and Folly, Sleep With Me, Dagaz Media, and Winter Hill Brewing Company. These are major contributors who helped sustain Podtails 2020 and allowed our show to continue virtually this year. Learn more on our website's sponsor page. Podtails 2020 is completely free. We believe in making the resources we're creating available and accessible to all. If you like what we're doing here and you have the means, please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash podtails. ASL interpretation for this session will be provided by Brandon C. Kazen Maddox of Body Language Productions. Learn more about Brandon's work at brandonkazen-maddox.com. Please feel free to use the chat feature here on YouTube to say hello and ask a few questions of our panelists today. I'll be keeping an eye on the conversation and we'll pose a few of these questions to the group before the end of the hour. So now without further ado, I would like to introduce Bob Raimunda, a writer and producer based out of New Rochelle, New York. Bob is the co-founder of the podcast production company Rogue Dialogue, through which he's created, directed, co through which he's co-created, directed, and written for two shows, Windfall and Forgive Me. 
He's also written an episode of the long-running fiction podcast, The Truth, and had small voice acting roles in shows like Fireside Folktales, The Truth, and Primordial Deep. Take it away, Bob. Oh, Bob, you are muted. That is okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, thank you again, Jordan, and everyone here for joining us today. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce the incredible writers and creatives that we have here with us. Um, up first, we have Bilal Dardai. Bilal is an award-winning playwright and performance artist based primarily out of Chicago for the past 20 years. He is an ensemble member of Lifeline Theater and an alumnus member of the Neo Futurists. In the realm of audio drama, Bilal has worked on the writing staffs for Unwell, Alba Salix, Royal Physician, and Pleasure Town, as well as adapting a series of Edgar Allan Poe works for Lifeline. He is also the writer of Six to Start's forthcoming Spellcast and an upcoming audio adaptation of The Mandala of Sherlock Holmes. He lives in Evanston with his wife, son, and dog. Up next, we have Emily Vanderwerf. Emily is the critic at large for Vox, the host for Vox's podcast Primetime, and the co-creator of the audio fiction show Arden. She is a founding member of the Trans Journalist Association and helped create its style guide, a resource for other journalists to more accurately write about transgender people and issues. She is much tolerated by her cats. Up next, we have Meg Malloy Tootin. Meg is a writer, animator, and voice actor who pulls triple duty on the comedy podcast Less Is Morgue. Their most famous work includes a video of Pennywise, Angry Dancing to Take On Me, a Lemony Snicket fan sequel that never got finished, and that No Sleep Christmas special where it's in a Walmart and the decorations kill people. They are the only human alive who remembers the ketchup vampires. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, we have Lee Davis Thalborn. Lee is a gentle cat lover with a passion for statistics and data. He is a bisexual cis man who lives with his partner and co-producer, Aaron, in St. Kilda, Melbourne, with their two cats, Tribble and Boop. You may have heard his voice in a number of productions, such as Love and Luck, Interference, Hit the Bricks, and Mars's Best Brisket. Lee has been helping out behind the scenes in many productions and demonstrations over the years, both live and digital. Sexual, supernatural Sexuality was his first role as showrunner and writer. Writing for many of us is often an extremely solitary practice, but fiction podcasting is at its very core, a collaborative medium that relies on the cooperation of writers, actors, composers, and sound designers to come together to create a project much bigger than their individual contributions. What we're here to discuss today is why some of us decide to embrace collaboration even earlier in the process by utilizing and employing a writer's room. While I know the idea isn't for everyone, there's something so magical about a group of people coming together so they can decide collectively what's best for a story's future. So the first thing I'd like to ask everyone is, how soon into the development of process of your podcast did you decide to use a writer's room? Or if you join the production already in development, what about the idea of writing collaboratively enticed you to do so? Um, and up first, can we hear from Bilal? Uh, sure. Um, so for, uh, for Unwell, um, uh, Unwell began with a writer's room. Unwell uh, uh, was always set up that way. Um, I interviewed with, with uh, the producers with Heartlife um, when the idea for the show was, was as simple as like four words long. It was Midwestern Gothic mystery. And that was kind of all we knew for certain when we came in to talk about it. Um, but I and the other three writers, so Jessica Best, Jessica Wright Buha, Jim McDonnell, and the executive producers, Eleanor Hyde and Jeffrey Hills Gardner, um, we spent like two months, approximately two months, once a week, meeting for two hours just to like figure out what it was we wanted to say with the story and figure out. You know, and then from there, figure out which characters we're going to use to tell that story. And like, I mean, everything was like ground up from scratch. Um, and so, and I will say for me, I come from a background of device theater. 
Um, and a lot of the process of creating this show involved, it, it's adjacent. It's, uh, it's getting together with, with multiple brains and letting them bounce off each other and uh, figuring out which, you know, figure out which ideas are gonna rise to the top. Um, and so I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, I, I love that process in general. I mean, I agree that like, that often writing can be very solitary, but I, I tend to enjoy having multiple people and their perspectives smashed together. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. And it's, it's, I didn't know that you had all come into Unwell when it was that much of an in its infant stage, but I think it comes through so much in the writing and how consistent all of the characters are for all of you, no matter who's writing. Um, what about you, Lee? Um, so when we, when me and Aaron first discussed doing Supernatural Seabrook and me being the showrunner, um, one of the first things I noted was that I did not have any confidence in my ability as a writer. So if we were going to do this, we certainly needed to bring other writers on board. Um, especially because even initially at the start, um, Seabrook was designed, I've often thought of it internally as kind of like an anthology where every story is a conversation with Dr. Seabrook. So every single one of these calls is an individual story. So it's really lent itself very well to distributing the work out to lots of different people. Um, and so when we thought about it, it's like, well, this is a great way of bringing lots of people within Australia into the audio fiction space, something that wasn't very well served at the time. It's getting much better served these days. Um, but at the time, there weren't a lot of writers that are thinking of audio fiction as something worth writing for. So we decided, well, if we need to bring writers on board, how about we use this as a way of spreading audio fiction throughout the Australian community? And so that's sort of where the genesis started for that one. Awesome. Yeah, I think the format of your show is mm -hmm. so indicative of mm -hmm. how incredible it is to have so many people together because mm -hmm. you get so many different characters in every episode that you really allow yourself to have different voices every time. Um, and it's incredible. And it's, it's also great because like you, like I could never come up with all the different types of calls that we have. Like there are so many different weird and crazy different stories like a single writer couldn't come up with that kind of variety however 18 writers certainly can absolutely uh, what about you meg um it's funny because the uh the writer's room for less is morgue existed before the show did um because we uh um sort of mid 2019 i think um Henry, my partner, who I now live with, came up with the idea of like us and a few of our uh, friends that we had worked on other projects with, like No Sleep, Congeria, Alexandria Archives, um, getting everybody together in a big group to um, really create something that was ours because um, uh, a lot of the people that we work with, like um, Scott Thomas, our <coughs> producer, um Gus Agarella, one of our um staff writers I guess you could call him um they they had been like kind of not doing anything as their like main thing they'd been like smaller parts of other things where they hadn't been regularly involved in the production so we were just like well let's make a team of all of us like second bananas um <laughs> and um through a process of like group calls and like uh th that we all decided on the idea for less is more together we literally had like a march madness style bracket for what kind of monster each of the characters would be and like okay these are the jokes that we could do with this combination these are the jokes that we could do with this combination and that's how we ended up with riley and evelyn and um it was really hard for me to like adjust to being in a writer's room because uh my thing normally as animation where I do all of the voice acting, all of the storyboarding and all of the color and cleanup. So I've become sort of a control freak in my professional life. Uh, but it's been really good to be a part of a collaborative project. That's that's really fantastic. Less is Morgue is such an absolutely hilarious show. And every time I think that it's not going to top itself, it does. <laughs> so I just want to hats off to you all there. Um, you. Emily, what about Arden? Arden is kind of a ca Katamari Damasi that went horribly wrong. 
Um, <laughs> we, uh, the, the idea came like, the idea sort of bop, bopped into my head in summer 2016, where I was like, what if we did cereal, but we did it like moonlighting? That could be fun. Um, and I took it to Crystal, who's someone I had written with many times. And he, I, then I forgot about it. I was like, that was a fun idea, but I'm never going to do anything like that. Uh, and then Chris came back like six months later and was like, look at all these things I've come up with. And I was like, okay, <laughs> all right. Um, and that was, you know, the start of a lot of the characters and some of the world of the show. But then we brought in Sarah Golub, who's our third co-creator. She introduced a bunch of concepts to the show that uh, hadn't been there before. And then late in season one, I was struggling on writing a script and I normally write with my wife, uh, Libby Hill. So we said, hey, do you want to come in and help with this? And she did. And then in season two, we were like, let's hire a full room. And so we went out and found writers. Like we had people send us submissions. We read through them. It took a long time. We did interviews. And then we ended up with a seven person room and everybody in that room brought something new to the discussion. We wanted to do it because we like having extra perspectives. Like the, the, the groundwork of the show is automatically built in. We have three co-creators. We have three different points of view within the show itself. But we wanted to have more people there because season two especially deals with mental illness. And everyone has a different journey with mental illness. And we want to get as many of those journeys in our room as possible. So... Uh, Arden is just, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, I like to think of it as a, a creative family in a lot of ways. We have a lot of people who are just part of our world now and that makes the show better. And I'm, I wouldn't do it any other way. Unequivocally, I think working in a group does nothing but help the story. If, if like, I can think back on being an undergrad and, and just starting to write and, and being told to write with someone else and being almost offended at the idea. And now I, I couldn't even imagine working on any of my projects without someone else to bounce ideas off of and to tell me, no, that's utterly wrong. Um, so I think it's fantastic to see how much that team has grown in that way. It's, it's really apparent. Arden season two has been fantastic. Um, I think that that leads really perfectly into my next question because um, when you're assembling your writer's room or you're agreeing to be a part of a writer's room, I would love to hear what is important to each of you when seeking out potential collaborators. Um, Lee? Um, so in so in our case, um, when we first did Seabrook, one thing we knew is that it, it's got to be queer, right? Like we were both queer people, like the kind of shows that we were based on. Um, Supernatural Sexuality is actually based on like the actual concept itself is kind of based on an Australian show called Pillow Talk with Dr. Feelgood, which was a late night sex and relationship show. Um, I see Meg has got, Meg, oh, I remember I've that. that yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. I was um, saying he's either going to say Pillow Talk or The Hookup. <laughs> yep. They're definitely Pillow Talk. Yeah. Um, which was really annoying because they took the good, they took the good title. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> anyway. But anyway, um, so when we sort of looked at this, like, well, those sort of shows in the 90s, because they were in the 90s, didn't bring up a lot of queer stuff. And so we really wanted to lean right into it. So when we act, so when we actually called out for writers, because both of our seasons we've done writer call outs, we explicitly said we are specifically looking for queer writers. We will only accept queer writers for this show. And unsurprisingly, that is exactly what we got. Um, one thing we did not get a great deal of is diversity of any other kind. So we had plenty of trans people, we had plenty of queer people. We did not do very well when it came to um, racial diversity um, or anything like that. Um, so season two, we said, you know what? Let's just say it. We're only going to accept people of color writers for this year. And while we invited many of our previous writers back, um, we also hired a great deal more. So I think now we have about 20, 28 writers or so on this year. Um, possibly even more um so like there's going to be there's going to be a lot of people writing and we specifically wanted to build that diversity into the room like one of the, cause especially since the point of this we want all these calls to be a little bit different we want them all to have their own specific style and while we don't ask our people to write to their experiences we encourage them to do so if that's what they want so we want to make sure that everyone's experiences can be reflected in the show Awesome. What about you, Meg? Um, I'm sorry. What was the question? 
No, it's okay. Uh, when when you were assembling your writer's room, what was the most important thing for you when selecting potential collaborators that would actually become a part of that core group? Well, for season one, um, we really didn't have anybody outside of uh, what we call the Preps Collective. Um, so that's me, Henry, Scott, Gus, Lexi, um, and then Sean and Jasper, who are two of my friends from back home. And um, other than that, we, we, we have one episode that was guest written. But other than that, we didn't have any um, real collaboration outside of the, you know, outside of the little clique. Um, for season two, we did put out a writer's call. And um, with Less Is More, it's all about whether or not you vibe with the sense of humor. So, like, if we got people to send in their pitches and... Um, not to call anyone out specifically, but like some of them, it's like, did, it's a little bit confusing. It's like, did, are you listening to a different show to us? Because there'll be a lot that are like, well, they go down to the bulwark and then, uh, okay, that's just the title of the show. That's not actually. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you really like the only requirement to write on Less is Morgue is you have to be funny and you have to have listened to season one. <laughs> um other than that, uh, we're pretty much open to everybody. And um, once we have found people whose work that we like, we get them on a Discord call and workshop the ideas further. And then they come back to us with a finished draft. And then we do sort of like a write up just to make sure that everything fits in the continuity of the show. And yeah, it's a pretty, um, we don't really get a lot of people in from outside the group. We'd like to get more. Um, we always are accepting more, but, um, as it stands, season two and season one, there haven't been quite as many outside writers as we like. It is just like the, the, the seven of us. Yeah, no, it's, it's incredibly important that the people <clears throat> that are joining do understand mm -hmm. the core of the show because, mm -hmm. you know, w what are they going to get otherwise? Yeah. Um, Emily, what were some of the things that you were looking for? Or when you were going through the scripts. Now, did you have them do spec scripts in any way, or, or was it all samples that they had already done themselves? We had them submit samples, and um, we hired three writers, and the writers' samples were, um, of the people we hired, were a Steven Universe spec, a, um, uh, a script about a uh, guy who invents, a like a, a comedic script about a guy who invents a, a robot? I I don't. It was, it was some very queer. I don't remember precisely. I don't want to. So I don't want to like misquote it. But it was an extremely queer script about a robot, um, and uh, somebody who wrote a really freaky, um, messed up horror movie. And like all three of those things, we were like, yeah, that fits in the Arden world. Um, so we hired all three of those people. <laughs> and one of the things that we like, we really. I sort of joke about this, but it is really true. Like, like when you look at our co-creators, you know, Sarah comes from a comedy writing background. Um, Chris comes from a theatrical background. I come from a background of trying to uh, ex expurgate my um, psychological trauma all over the world. So like, that's kind of how we function already. So we brought in writers to sort of reflect that and then to sort of reflect the story we knew we were telling, which was a riff on Hamlet. Um, the thing that I think we, we could, we need, we are going to do a better job of when we hire for season three, uh, is we're going to hire more, uh, racial diversity. We do have people of color in our writer's room. Um, not nearly enough. Uh, we have very good queer representation for some reason. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, we, we can do better in terms of other forms of diversity. Um, another, you know, another, um, another kind of diversity I'd love to see reflected as we move forward is I would like to write more stories about, um, you know, people from the disabled community. And um, that's not a thing anybody in our room has experience with. So we would have to hire for that. Um, but it does kind of come out of Chris and Sarah and I get together and talk about what the season's going to look like. And then we're like, oh, we're going to look for people who can sort of tell that story. And we hire from there. Awesome. Now, Bilal, I know you earlier said that you kind of all came in together when Unwell was just a, a very short pitch. Had you worked with that team before? Or uh, So I, uh, 
I, I had worked with Eleanor, it, one of the executive producers, in a theatrical capacity. Uh, Eleanor had been managing director for a theater company I did a lot of work with. Um, Jeffrey, no. Uh, uh, I knew Heart Life primarily from their prior show, Our Fair City. Um, which show. was a show, a, show, a show I adored. And so it was one of those, one of those things where when Eleanor became the executive director at Heart Life and reached out to me about this, this idea, I was like, I would love to work with the people who did Our Fair City. Um, so yeah, as far as, as far as the original question, I mean, I, I actually can't answer specifically why, <laughs> why Jeffrey and Eleanor hired any of us specifically. I can, I can say what I know of the team that we have and hopefully that's why they hired us. Um, but I think that like, uh, I think that one thing that like maybe binds us as, as a, as a group of writers and, um, and creators and, and Jeffrey as a director and such is that there is a real sense of, I think a sense of sensitivity to the story we're telling. Um, because we are, you know, we are telling a, a gothic horror, gothic suspense type thriller and that, and understanding how to write in those notes is important. Uh, and not all of us had the same level of experience with that. But I think uh, it was also very important that we were that we were treating these characters with as much humanity as possible and much uh, empathy as possible. And that, you know, and I think when we have discussions in a room about the characters and the arcs they're going to take, um, I think the discussions, they, they, they obviously bring up like plot points and such, but I think we spend a lot of time asking how we take care of the characters and the story in a way that is not that is not just us like saying, well, this would be cool to do as much as this is the way the story needs to go. Um, and this is the way that, this is the way that we can tell the story. That's not, uh, that's not harmful, frankly, to, to the audience or you know, to ourselves. Cause I think one of the things that we are dealing with is, uh, I mean, the, one of the overriding plots is, is a woman taking care of her ailing mother. And that was, an important thing for all of us in that room because to various degrees we either have or are expecting one day to deal with something like that and we can't we can't go into that uh you know treating it treating it as something alien treating it as something we just can't be insensitive to it i think and i think that's that's a very and again whether that question came up in interviews i i mean i don't even remember all my questions from the interviews, but I think, I think the thing that Eleanor and Jeffrey did very well was look at the group of us and say that, yes, this group can handle that mission. Yeah, I think you all do that so expertly because Unwell has the capacity to be such a horrifying show, but it's also so incredibly wholesome and welcoming with all the interpersonal relationships in it. So I think that was definitely an unmitigated success. Um, I am always curious to hear when people work in writer's room, how each team actually divides up the work. Is it that you're writing individual episodes? Are you breaking a whole season together? Um, and then how, when you do do it and all is said and done, how do you ensure that there is a consistent voice across the entire season when you do have so many people working together? Um, Emily? Gosh, um, this is a thing that, uh, you know, we, we think about a lot. Um, at this point, uh, Chris and Sarah and I kind of have a mind meld going. Um, Libby and I definitely have a mind meld going. I keep pointing there because she's on the other side of that wall. <laughs> and I'm like, of course, Libby, you know, she's right over there. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it is a thing where um, if somebody is credited on our show uh, as the writer, they either did the first draft of that or several early drafts. Um, but it, you know, those drafts change. We move stuff around. We've had episodes this season that are credited to a single writer that had contributions from all seven members of our staff. And that's not because the drafts they turned in were bad. They were often quite good. It was just, we had to shuffle things around from episode to episode, or there was a scene we needed to hit a different note, or we wrote these scripts back in spring 2019. And then we cast an actor who was very different from the Dana Hamill we talked about in the room, who's our Hamlet analog. So we had to like, rewrite a bunch of stuff to sort of fit what she was giving us and like all those things you know happen regardless of the quality of the draft so the important thing is that you have 
someone who is coming in and and making sure everything sort of fits together um and in season two that you know uh, was that duty was sort of fell between chris and sarah and i um but i i tried to do a pass on every script because we split loosely split production up between the three of us and i was in charge of pre-production so i tried to do a pass on every script and like that was helpful i think will we be able to do that going forward probably not because it added like six months to our production time but um it is good to have a consistent voice come in and do a pass toward the end of the process i think yeah yeah i think that makes perfect sense and also i know the vibe of finding an actor that completely changes the trajectory of a character. It's, and, and it has nothing to do with the quality of the script and everything to do with how much that character has intrinsically changed because of the performer that you have cast in that role. Um, Lee, I'd love to hear from you here because I, you've got such an interesting case where you have multiple writers on every episode. Yes, we do. So the way, as I said, we are an exceptionally modular show. So every episode has three or four smaller calls. And basically what happens is that each of our writers don't necessarily write much in a room. We've sort of experimented with trying to sort of give them a discord space to sort of discuss between them and get advice and stuff. We found a lot of them don't tend to take that. What they tend to do is they tend to go off, write the draft, and then it comes back to us. And then me and Aaron will go through every single draft. We will go through it. All right, so we like this. Um, we think that maybe your solution could probably use these particular issues. Because when we talk to, when we sort of have our writers bring in pitches for their various calls, we specifically ask them, give us the setup of the problem. And we wanna, want you to tell us what kind of solution Seabrook is going to advise for this. Because the idea of Seabrook is that every, you know, every call should have some kind of solution. Even if Seabrook doesn't know exactly what to do, she should at least have some direction for them to go to. And so when we go through all this, yeah. so we go through like, is this solution appropriate? And we go through those details. When it comes to the voice of Seabrook, we actually didn't worry so much about that in season one, because we hadn't cast, we didn't cast until all the scripts had come through at that point, because we wanted to, we wanted to know how many people we were casting for. So that was kind of important. And it turned out when we got to the studio, um, we worked quite extensively with Mama Boho, who is our Seabrook. And we actually worked very hard to sort of build that um, that consistency of voice into the performance. So we actually went through a few cases where we actually re extensively rewrote Seabrook's part of the script, which was awkward because we had already recorded everyone else before we recorded Seabrook. So I had to like make sure the obviously the rewrites were would deal with the script we already had from the other people. It was very very difficult. Um, but yeah, so. Because everything's very modular, a lot of our writers do in fact write on their own a great deal, but we actually make sure we actually do that because 18 writers, if there's 18, 18 people in a room, like you, you can't have a collaboration on that level. You need to sort of split up the graph a bit, at least a little bit. In season two, we are actually changing this a little bit. We have a group of writers who are writing a specific arc within the season that are going to be working together in a much more of a writer room kind of situation. Um, they will have their own individual calls, but we'll need them to sort of work together to deal, to sort of get that arc going. So we're experimenting a little bit, but otherwise the way we do it is basically we try to keep everyone as separate as possible and me and Aaron sort of be uh, the point where everything goes through in order to maintain consistency. Absolutely. And I, I love how much and how clear it is that Mama Boho's ex performance is what mm. is bringing them all together and making mm. a lot of that consistency work. Um, mm. It's such a wonderful presence. I, I love that show. She, she, she's a dream to work with, like working with someone who's been an actor for like 20 years, who has been in broadcasting and stuff like that. Like we, we were so lucky to get her, honestly. Um, made my job as a director so much easier. Absolutely. Meg, I'd love to hear from you here because not only are you a big presence in the writer's room, but you're also one of the stars of the show. So I feel like you've probably got a, a big presence in some of those later passes on a script. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a very similar setup to what Emily and uh, her team does. Like, um, I, it's, it's pretty similar that we sort of credit whoever did the first draft or like whoever wrote most of it but at different points like every member of the team will have 
some level of input because we do big calls and we'll do them in like chunks. It's usually me and Henry and one other person or maybe two other people um, reading through it, um, doing it, doing like a quick table read um, and then just editing whatever. And then I, I find that sometimes I will even make edits on the day that I'm recording because if I'm going through the script and I see a line and I'm and I'm thinking to myself, Evelyn wouldn't say that. Um, I will just record an alt and then go back in and edit the script <laughs> and let everybody know that I've done that. Um, like there have been a couple of times where where she has said a bad word, and as we all, if you've listened to the show, you know that Evelyn mm. Evelyn Hooper, she's got to be real mad to even say heck. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, that's sort of how we do it. And, uh, like I said, when we get guest writers on, we have them in a discord call and we workshop it and then we'll, um, discuss any subsequent drafts with them in other calls. So it's really just a lot of, a lot of playing phone tag. Yeah, absolutely. That makes per perfect sense. The, the voice on us as Morg is, is so consistent. So I'm, I'm not surprised prize to hear that it comes in so many drafts like that. Now, Bilal, um, I, I know for Unwell, you're primarily at least on an episode level, each getting single credit, and it doesn't feel like there's any sort of division by by characters next year, necessarily, but, and correct me if I'm totally off base here, but sometimes it feels like you each sort of specialize in a location in a certain way. And so a lot of times different locations, specific locations will be attributed to each of you. Yeah, uh, so so I guess one thing I can say, so uh, simplest possible version of how we split up work is that it's 12 episodes and it's four writers. So we each do three, but, uh, but before that happens, um, we are all sitting in a room for at least, you know, one meeting, maybe two discussing the arc of the whole. And we're discussing like, well, these are the plot points we need to hit between episode one and episode twelve, and then uh, and then together as a group, and then with you know with guidance from Eleanor and Jeffrey, those get kind of parceled out into individual episodes, and you say like, this is the episode where you know where uh, where Lily and Marisol have this happen. This is the episode where Rudy has this happen. Um, and after we've kind of separated all those those basic outline plot points. We basically do a round robin draft. Like we go around the room one at a time and say, well, I really want to do episode six, like based on what's here. And somebody will say, I want to do episode one. Um, I mean, and if after we've all picked, there might be some negotiation. We, generally speaking, we all, especially, so we're, we're in the process of starting season four. And I know like by season three, by the time we'd already, we kind of understood each other. Like, like oh, that's, that's one that, that Buha is probably going to take. And I'm going to stay away from it and go after this one. Um, but yeah, we don't have specific assignments on character or specific assignments on place. Um, I will say that over time, it's become clear how we gravitated individually to them. Uh, and I think that like, I think that we as a group, like we don't have like conversations where we say these things out loud, but like organically, we also kind of understand that like somebody has spent a lot more time writing this character. And, and we can, you know, let them set the pace for it. And like, I'm going to try to follow the things that, that, you know, just best wrote for, for Abby um, and say like, this is, this is what, this is what best gave us for Abby. And uh, part of my job when I'm writing Abby is to not undercut what best has done. Um, and to, cause, cause we, cause we like what best has done. Um, and I think similarly, like I've, I spent a lot of time with Rudy and Nora last season um and that and so they've and and this next season i might not this next but but what i have done there is hopefully you know given people like a blueprint to work from um but as far as like consistency like it's just we you know we sit down and table read every script as a group and we will spend time like you know say you know we'll we'll take a moment with each other's lines and say i'm not sure that I'm not sure that dot would put it that way, but you might put it this way. And the, those notes will come in and the writer goes back and redoes their draft. So um, so all the scripts that are single credited are, I think, properly single credited. Um, for as much input as we put in, it's still on that one script writer to 
to polish the final. And, uh, you know, in, in prior years, obviously not this year, but we would be in the room, you know, watching the recording and we would help be, help be, you know, creating those revisions in the room. Cause when we have the actors there, it'd be like, Oh, I, now that I hear that line, uh, now that I hear that line said out loud, I realize there's no way to say that line in a way that's going to satisfy me with the words I have put for it. So why don't, why don't you say it this way instead? Or, or the, you know, or sometimes the actor will, will step over a line or like miss, like, like misread a line. I'm like, oh, that's better. That's more natural. Like it should be that. And just let them, let them rewrite it in the moment. Um, and yeah, I will say, <laughs> this is one of the things I, I miss most um, having to work in the pandemic is, is not being able to be in the room for that. Yeah, it's, I, I remember producing, you know, both of my shows. It was always working with the actors. It was very much, if something that we have written sounds wrong, it's wrong. And mm -hmm. it's not, you know, gospel on the page. And let's work together to figure out something that sounds better. Um, yeah. So my next question is, is something that I think a lot of people might, it might turn them off of the idea of, of writing on a room. And, and I'm always interested to hear how people handle situations like this, because obviously we're all dealing in these cases with a shared group of egos that may not always see fully eye to eye when it comes to what's best for the story. Um, I would love to hear how each of your teams handles internal conflict when it comes to writing and how have you overcome those roadblocks or if they haven't come up at all, God bless you. <laughs> uh, how about we can start with Meg? Oh, it's interesting. Um, we have had a few little bumps along the road. Um, and if we're being fully honest with ourselves here, I am the one who handles it the worst every single time. Um, I've got ADHD and part of that is um, a condition called re rejection sensitivity dysphoria, which basically Represent. means if I, yeah, if, if I feel like somebody's telling me that I'm wrong, I shut down and um, spiral into a pit of despair. And uh, it can take me a while to like adjust to change. So if like a huge, um like story point that i've come up with would like has to be edited out um sometimes it, it it sometimes i'm very stubborn but i've been getting a lot better about it and i think that it's just the more you work with other people the better you get at working with other people and i wouldn't say that anybody else on the preps team has has an ego at all i think we're all good at working with each other um i just happen to be uh, a little bit challenged in that department, but I am getting better. I feel that. I feel like I'm I'm often the one that gets the most emotional in my team. So I I feel that deeply to my yeah. core. Um, Emily, what about Arden? I think Arden is an interesting case because our show is inherently about nobody quite agreeing on what happened. So mm -hmm. we had we don't have a lot of conflict among the, the core creative team, the writer's room. And then when you drill down to um, Sarah and Chris and I and Libby is usually pulled into some of those discussions too in some way. Um, we tend to see things similarly. Um, indeed, you know, um, Chris and Sarah and I go over the scripts at the very end to make sure we're all on the same page about them. But we had one really huge conflict in the writer's room in season two where both sides had different ideas of what should happen and both ideas were to me equally interesting in different ways and i can't say what it is because it, it, it's a mild spoiler a lot of it has already happened but not all of it so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna spoil it but we wrote it into the show we wrote into the show the conflict over what happened and we gave characters sort of different points of view on it and I think it made the season stronger. Um, I think the more you can take those discussions and make them to the text of your show, the richer your show will become. Because you want you want people who are have different points of view, having different things to say within your characters. Why would you not want that among your writers? 
Absolutely. I, I totally agree. And I think that makes it, I, I'm not surprised at all to hear that that's how that was handled in Arden, which is such a beautifully meta show in a way that I adore. So I, I love hearing that. Um, Bilal, what about Ananwell? Um, I think, I mean, so it's one of those things where right now I'm having trouble like thinking of a specific conflict, but I think that's, I'm, I'm, I think that's healthy. <laughs> I feel I'm, I feel okay about that. Um, I know we have them, um, and I think part of what we as a group have gradually we started off pretty good at and gradually gotten better at is um, uh, picking battles, like knowing knowing what it is you're really really willing to go to the mat for, um, and holding a lot of your ideas loosely. Um, and I think, you know, just like making sure you're willing to be convinced, um, like, like being able to defend the things that you feel strongly about and willing to be convinced on the things that, uh, that you, that you are willing to negotiate on. Um, because I mean, what I, what I find often in that room is that something I brought in, uh, there's a reason, there's a reason I did not see when I wrote it, why it doesn't work. And somebody in that room is gonna is gonna find like the find the, the exact vulnerable point of it and poke it and it will deflate and I'll be like yeah yeah you yeah you're absolutely right I'll go back to the drawing board with it. Absolutely. What about you, Lee? So we so with Seabrook we didn't have a great deal of conflict and part of that was because the way we structured it, me and Aaron were the ultimate arbiters of what got accepted. And basically the draft wasn't done until we said it was done in those cases. What I did know is that I did spend a lot of time trying to communicate with our writers why a particular thing in the draft we wanted to change. We'd often try and give sort of suggestions and say, look, this is a suggestion we'd like. Um, if you can come up with something which sort of satisfies the same things, we're happy to have a look at it. We try to sort of give freedom in that respect. I think about the only time that we had like a writer who very who very heavily pushed back was probably the one time I wasn't that great in communicating why we wanted to get it done. Um, mm. uh, it was one, I think it was actually the season finale of season one, that particular call where there, it was, it was a very long call. There were a lot of, lots of moving parts with it. And we just, just really wanted it to simplify down a bit further because there were a few through lines we thought these are very interesting through lines and the rest just sort of felt a bit, bit wandering. And the writer did not agree. The writer was very certain that all parts of these were sort of particularly important. So I ended up having to spend sort of half an hour to an hour going through the email saying, look, these are the reasons why I want to do this. I'm sorry I wasn't more, um, more clear in why we want these changes. And once we went through that and sort of went through that negotiation with the writer, we eventually got a script that we were all quite proud of. And I quite um, appreciated sort of right at the end. So in terms of conflict for us, like we lean on hierarchy really heavily to sort of resolve those kind of conflicts. It's like, guess we, like, we we are we are commissioning you for these scripts. We want your creative input, but ultimately we have to be satisfied with it. So when we ask you to ask you to make these amendments, we don't, we're not sort of specific on how you make those amendments, but we do need these changes. And so that's sort of how we deal with it. Cause yeah, when, we don't have writers sort of arguing against each other a great deal because they're not interacting with each other a great deal. But if there are people, writers who are saying, I, I really want this in there, it's like, all right, so we can figure out ways of dealing with this, but ultimately these are the, this is what we need and what we need comes first. Absolutely. I think that makes perfect sense. I think so much of this balance is down to having good communication with the people that you're working with and knowing what is right for the story. I think, honestly, that sounds, having that hierarchy sounds wonderful. Um, and I, I think that that could make things sometimes easier, but so much of it does just balance it down to a lot of what Bilal said earlier too, of knowing uh, which battles to pick and which battles to be convinced on. I, yeah. I, that really stands out to me. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Jordan now. Do we have any questions from the stream? Oh, we sure do. Loads. <laughs> um, all right. So this very first one, let's start with what does a successful pitch or spec script look like to you for your writer's rooms? 
I can yeah, go for it, Emily. I don't know how do we do it now. I'm used to being called on. Um, uh, yeah, we. Uh, I. Um, I'm a big fan of the writing of the TV showrunner Damon Lindelof, um, and I have been lucky enough to like get to a place where he's given me writing advice and such. Mm. And one of the things he said to me that has stuck with me is. I don't need to hire people who write like me because I know I can write like me. I need to hire people who have vastly different voices. So what am I looking for in a spec or a pitch? I'm looking for literally you writing the best in your own voice that you possibly can, because I can teach you how to write Arden. I'm not going to be able to teach you how to, I'm not going to be able to teach you how to write like yourself. I want to see you already can do that. And you can come in and I can say, well, you know, Bia wouldn't say that. Rosalind wouldn't do that. But like, yeah, I just want people who have really strong points of view and really strong voices and are really sort of in command of that element of their craft. And those are the people I want in my room. Yeah, I, yeah. I, that's completely true for Lesses Morg as well. Like, we, um, yeah, like we, we know how to write the show already. And um, we just like to see people who can do things that are different. And I think that that's the, the true beauty of having a collaborative writing project is that you can. I mean, especially when it comes to um, comedy, you know, like it's strengthened by having more than one person's idea of like what a funny joke is in it. Uh, Cause that, you know, it'll get stale after a while if it's just the same people writing every time. You want to surprise everybody. Yeah, I'd say for, um, could you repeat the question again? Sorry, John. Yeah, what does a successful pitch or spec script look like to you? Yeah. Yeah. So in general, we don't do, we don't directly do spec scripts when we're selecting. We sort of ask people to basically provide a folio of their previous work because we, we're happy to hire any kind of writer, um, art, like, you know, writers, script writers, poets, we'll, we'll accept them all because it turns out writing a script is something that you can teach anyone. Like that's not something you need to worry about. Um, but what we, but when people actually provide us pitches for what kind of calls we want to write, we actually ask them to provide us like three or four pitches before we even get them to write anything else for us, because we want to see what they are interested in writing. And then we will go through those script, those pitches and go, all right, well, which of these are interesting to us that we haven't done before that aren't sort of retreads on previous calls we've had before. And we sort of go through that process of trying to sort of kind of pre-build the season before people start writing into it. Um, and so that's how, how do we sort of deal with pitches and selecting people. And I'll, I'll pass on this question. We, we actually just have a core team. We don't really accept pitches or specs right now. All right. Um, so this next one is a sketch comedy's writer's room I've been a part of for the last three years wants to attempt an audio drama. What advice do you have for sketch writers moving to a longer story? or just writers in general, probably? Build in parts. Um, if you're a kind of person who does sketches and sort of works on that kind of pacing, I'd probably say the best way to sort of ease yourself into it is to write individual scenes and then build the bridges in between them. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're a, a writer's room and everyone's like, yeah, I want to sort of, we want to sort of, sort of get that sort of build up going. Um, like I'm not generally a comedy writer generally, like I can be funny, but it's like, it's uncontrollable. I can't just throw that into a script. It just happens. Mm. <laughs> um, but I don't, but I think that when you're going from shorter sketches to longer stories, probably the better way to do it is to try and build sort of a scene structure that lets you play to those strengths. Um, I would, I would offer that uh, as a sketch comedy ensemble, I think uh, you're, you have a really, a unique resource, which is your ensemble. Uh, you know each other, you know each other's strengths, you know um, the things that you're best at and the way, like, you know, the chemistry between each other. And I think as you're building a longer story, you can rely on the things you know about each other to let that guide your overall arc. I, I personally, I'm a big fan of character driven uh, storyline, story, you know, creation. Um, and the fact that you already have actors whose voices you know is, I think, like going to be, it's just, I just, you know, make sure you utilize that. Don't worry so much about like, what's the story I'm going to tell? It's like, well, figure out your characters. Your characters will tell the story for you. 
Yeah. I'm a huge fan of the filmmaker Mike Lee. And the way Mike Lee does filmmaking is he gets actors he thinks would be interesting. He brings them together. They improvise until they have characters and a story they're sort of interested in or like they think is compelling. He kind of makes an outline of that. Then he goes and writes the script and then they make the movie. Within the space of podcasting where we often don't have enough money to pay people to just sit around for months on end and improvise for us, this is not a feasible model. But like, if you already have a team of people who are dedicated to working together and hang out all the time anyway, why not try some of that? Why not try improvising until you find some characters, following that idea? And the other piece of advice I'd have is um, Arden, one of our three co-creators, is a sketch comedy writer. And we do fake ads in our show. And every single one of those fake ads is a, is a sketch, is a comedic mm -hmm. sketch. And it's been a way to sort of keep that in the DNA of our show that has gradually gotten, it's still very comedic, but it's gradually incorporated more notes and more tones to it. But we always can go back to those ads and have something just very funny in like three minutes or less. So figure out a way to do that, I guess, to keep sketch part of a longer story. Yeah, um, we do fake ads on Less Is Morgue as well. Um, and so um, I don't have anything else to add other than that, because it's pretty much exactly what uh, Bilal and Emily said. Awesome, Jordan, have we got time for one more? Oh yeah, we have four minutes. <laughs> for plenty, of time. plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so how do you decide just how large a room should be? Is there a point where adding additional writers becomes counterproductive? And if so, how do you know where that point is? Um, I can tell you the answer is no, but you're really got to structure it well. <laughs> um, it is possible to have a clown car as your writer's room, like just shove, shove as many writers in there <laughs> as possible. But if you are doing that, remember that every person you add sort of increases the network of people who need to get each other's feedback. It, if you want to have a truly collaborative area where everyone is taught, is like participating in the same process, there is a limit to that. And I think, I think the limit's about 10 before it gets absolutely impossible. Um, has anyone, does anyone have like any evidence to the contrary on that one? I mean, I, no, there's a lot, I'm, I'm I'm famously terrible at counting, but there are nine of us yeah. on uh, the Proach Collective, and <laughs> there's never been a time when all of us have been writing together. It's usually mm. capped out around four, so that's a nice, comfortable number. Well, that's what I would say. <laughs> yeah, but right, Emily. Oh no, go ahead, Lee. Yeah. I was about to say, but yeah, sort of the yeah, we specifically structured it so we could shove as many writers into it as possible. And it turns out the structure has actually been, we've actually been able to um, sort of expand that structure quite significantly. Um, if you do it, remember, it's going to be a lot of work for the head writer because they, they still have to be the one to interact with every other writer. Yeah. So, so there is still a limit to how many people you can actually admin with. <laughs> we, we went into season two thinking we'd have a six person room. We ended up with seven because we were like, this is going to be really ambitious. Let's bring in one more writer. Um, I kind of tend to think uh, you should you should sit down and figure out a rough outline of what your episodes look like as showrunners, head writers, whatever, and then you have a better sense of we have this many episodes. How many drafts do we personally want to have to generate? And then you can start to find out. It's, it is kind of a math problem. For instance, I'm working on a new project that is ten half hour episodes. We are locked into it being ten by the structure of what we're adapting, and like. So I can sit there and kind of do the math and be like, okay, it's me and one other head writer, and we're probably gonna need to hire two other people. And like, so that's that's what we're doing. We're looking for two other writers to write 10 episodes at a half hour each. And like, I think once you've done it a while, you can you can do the math, but I would say, I would say four to four to ten is about what you would wanna be looking for. Um, and probably right in the middle of that range for a 12, 13 yeah. episode season. Yeah, I mean, our writers' rooms, you know, held steady at six, but I will say that, like, when we do the season read-through, um, after all scripts have been drafted and put in, and then we have, you know, 15 to 20 actors in the room reading them with us, we are soliciting feedback from them. We are getting input from them, because we also, we, we feel that as well as we know their characters, they also know their characters very well, and in, in many ways better than we will. And so we do have we do have this 
moment where the writer's room balloons to like 30. Mm -hmm. And, but then the rest of the time it stays at six. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, we at the end of this, at, if, as we start planning season three, we're gonna bring Michelle Agresti and Tracy Syed into some meetings because they know Bea and Brenda better than we do in some ways. So it's worth hearing what they have to say. Awesome, well, thank you all so much. It's been a complete honor for me to speak to all of you. I'm such a huge fan of all of your work. Um, I'm gonna pass it away to Jordan now for just a little outro. Thanks, Bob. Thanks to the panel and thanks to all of you for coming. This session is part of Podtails 2020, three weekends of programming brought to you in partnership with the Saras, the Sarah Lawrence College International Audio Fiction Awards. For a full list of sessions, visit podtails.org. That's P-O-D-T-A-L-E-S dot org. And be sure to subscribe to Podtails on the podcatcher of your choice to find the podcast showcase selections we'll be featuring from now through the end of the month on our feed. As a reminder, Podtails 2020 is completely free. We believe in making the resources we're creating available and accessible to all. If you like what we're doing here, please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash podtails. And finally, we would love to know what you think. You can find a panel feedback form linked both in the YouTube description below and over on the website event page. Please take a moment to fill that out and help us make Podtails even better in the future. Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely rest of your day.